Battistone and you're watching Norfolk Public Access and uh, this being state and local uh, we run on the government channel and we usually talk about issues political issues government issues uh, so we're going to do something a little bit different today but not really um, I've asked Father Terence McGillicuddy who is the uh, the reverend or the father at St. Bridget's Anglican Church in Medway to uh, come and speak with me about um, some of the the behaviors that we're seeing at, when these riots go on and the and the attitudes and the the apparent lack of of compassion and um, so I thought and he also is a, as a uh, clinical psychologist he does psycho spiritual counseling and so I thought it was kind of an interesting uh, person to talk to about this 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 whole matter that was kind of you know very very puzzling to me um, so, uh, thank you so much, Father, for right. coming on. I really appreciate it. Thank you for inviting it. me. You're oh, very welcome. So, when I was watching the news, watching, you know, Baltimore and, and Ferguson, I, I was just struck, and I, it's not enough to say these are teenagers, because I was, that's the mm -hmm. argument they're using with uh, Sarnayev, that he was uh, 18 or something like that, and then, of course, these, these kids that were riding in Baltimore, many of them were, were much younger than that. I just don't buy it that it's just a, an adolescent thing mm. I and I, I don't understand how you get it's in such a young age you get to this point of a sort of an impoverishment of 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 the soul or of 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 compassion for other people and so I just wanted to know I just want to know what you might have thought about that from the point of view of a, of a as a priest and then and also you know as a as a psychologist well there's so many lenses and ways to look at it but I mean first of all we're all just everybody's traumatized and I, th I think it's I can talk about that specifically but in some ways it's a microcosm I think of where everybody we're, we're all struggling these days I mean you know we're not in the same country we were even when I was a child I'm 59 years old and I mean a lot of what I grew up with I mean I had two pa I had parents I had a father and a mother I know that's a, an issue and a lot of people in Baltimore a lot of the African-American um, families struggle with that um, I mean everything is so different it's so hard to present a polemic but I mean as a pastor and as a counselor you know we all struggle with um, with whatever I mean when we grow up emptiness or trying to individuate so a lot of those people a lot of people in the riots were youth you know a lot of them I mean I love that scene where the mother comes and takes her son and you know and what surprised me more was that um, he was so receptive to his mother. So on one side you have this, this kid, I don't know how old he was, who's throwing rocks at the police, and the other thing, when his mother came, <laughs> it's like it, he settled right down. And, you know, and it, just, it told me that, you know, what, what, what are we lacking? You know? What do we lack in our own lives growing up? I mean, the society in and of itself, I think, is, is depraved from uh, lots of things. So, I mean, the riots are, I think it's a symptom, this love, a larger picture, you know? I mean, where is our country going, you know? I mean, everything's relativized now, a kind of, I mean, even <coughs> everybody's struggling, even with, uh, with in theology or a lot of the denominations now. Everything is in, in, in a spiral and changing so rapidly. So I think that just, I think that, um, you know, what do we hang on to? What, what's, what's stable? What is, and for, when I was 16 years old, you know what, I tell you, I needed to be safe. <laughs> I needed people who were there for me, uh, some sense of consistency and support and family. And I don't know what it would be like to grow up without that. I don't know what it would be like to live, you know, in a place and have a raising where I didn't have any of that. So. It's a, there's, a, there's a lot here that we don't know unless we're actually walking in the shoes of somebody else. But violence is never the answer. <laughs> but I understand what, what happens. But they, they, so. believe, they believe it is. 
I mean, they really, there's just like a, like a sociopathic quality mm -hmm. to this. I mean, that's what I, how I, the other thing, you know, that I think is, I just wonder, you know, when you just have the government, you know, giving people things and giving people things mm -hmm. and making excuses and, the, I mean, where does your sense, you know, wh where's your sense of identity or your sense of inner strength if you think that, well, I'm going to get this from this, I'm going to get this one from that, mm -hmm. you know, I mean, I just, I just find it hard to believe that that does not impact well, well it does your impact sense us. of dignity and your sense of... Yeah, but it impacts us by um, chaining us. <laughs> the dependency. Yeah, I mean, I don't think it works. The government can't solve our problems. And it tra entraps a lot of us into, you know, rather than liberating. But that, that's, been the, that's been a big message now for, for a number of years. I mean, certainly, you know, certainly this present administration, I mean, it's just grown and grown. And, mm -hmm. of course, the number of people that are on, on welfare and on assistance, that, that's, all, that's grown ex hugely. Mm -hmm. um, and and you, you, just, you just left saying, I mean, to me, it's, it's, it's kind of obvious that that's not the way a prosperous nation, you know, moves ahead. Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, I grew up in northern Maine, so I grew up in an economically depraved area, you know. But all I wanted, I'm thinking when I was growing up, I didn't want somebody to give me something. I was like, give me some dignity. Give me a job. <laughs> <laughs> and any way I could do that, whether it's delivering papers or mowing, I mean, but I wanted that, and I think even today, you know, I think we all have to regain dignity. I don't want people oppressing me by giving me everything. I want opportunity. And even in the last year, you know, I've been looking for different kinds of jobs to supplement it. It's very difficult, you know. It's very difficult when you can't find work. Now, mm -hmm. what does that do? Especially for me as a male and as a pastor, it's like it's, it's ext I mean, a lot of men especially, they find their uh, identity in their work. Right. And you take somebody who hasn't been employed for six months, or year, I mean, it is tough. So, I mean, uh, again, our experience is different, but I wonder what it would be like if we were able to help people work. <laughs> but I don't think it's fair, and it w uh, you know, I'm not here to take one side of the Democrats or the Republicans, but it's personally, I would rather have opportunity. Give me an opportunity to be the best that I can be or I can excel. And a lot of people don't have that, you know. If mm -hmm. I'm living in a place where, you know, if I can get uh, $7 an hour, I work at McDonald's or uh, $7,000 a day selling crack or whatever, I mean, it, it <laughs> I mean, what am I gonna do? But you why know? should that choice, I mean. Well, that's the, that's the point. Maybe for some people, that's their only, only choice. But you know, I mean, again, that's I know that's the political. <laughs> you know, we can talk about that a lot. But you know, if we go deeper behind that, what is it that's that we don't have? I, I again, I go back to my childhood. You know, give me stability, give me safe, give me a church community, people that'll love me and accept me un unconditionally. You know? We know that this is a, another thing that I find puzzling is that. I say most of the time when you have these these shootings and so forth, there's all sorts of, there's a vigil and there's a the service and then there's a shrine and there's a, all the trappings of religion, without the inner. Oh, that's a good point. You know the inner st strength or courage or, or or the sense of morality. Well, I mean, I put a lot of the and bad it, blame on people like Al Sharpton. Who is not is not you know has, is the epitome uh, oh. of uh, <laughs> oh, just a, a <laughs> throwing gasoline on the fire. Oh yeah, a complete know. con artist. So I mean, does does he have any? I wonder if he even has any kind of a of a degree. Well, I'm sure he degree. does, but in other words, it's what he. I mean, I, I'm not here to judge him, but I don't understand why he. You know, he throws fuel on the fire all the time. Oh, yeah. You know, this kind of conversation we're having about, you know, what is it that people are looking for and need spiritually, you know? He, he's, a, he's a politician, you know, oh, opportunist. Yeah. So I don't think he's 
Oh, he, tremendous. He's not helping the situation at all. Tremendous. I mean, I don't just consider pure. him a leader. Oh, God, no. Uh, a person of integrity. And there he is. What is, what is it? Four million? Is it four million dollars of unpaid federal taxes? And he's running in and out of the White House uh, every five minutes. I guess. I mean, the other thing that <clears throat> I mean. So, do you do you see this behavior as as sort of like? I, I maybe I'm using the term wrong, but we talk about dissociative behavior. Mm -hmm. Does is, does that mean that you are doing something that is contrary to what you actually are? In other words, I guess I guess I want to get to the point of of destroying all those stores in your own neighborhood. Now, mm -hmm. I, I mean. Clearly, they must have believed that, well, the government's just going to step in and build everything over, which is not, which never happens, never is restored. Mm -hmm. So is, is that a dissociative, what they call a dissociative behavior where you're well, it's behaving in a way that's totally... Well, it's primitive. <laughs> I mean, we all have that. We all, we all have that. We all have primitive kinds of instincts, and I mean, it's the fight or flight, you know. But again, how do we evolve... Uh, not only how, how we evolved as a civilization, but socially, spiritually, you know? Who's been there to teach us? Who are the most important people in your life, you know? Who have modeled, you know? And how do we, how do we deal with aggression, you know? I can't just go, if somebody drives in front of me when I'm on 128, you know, I'd like to, you know, smash their car. I can't do that. I'd probably be in jail rather than sitting here talking to you. I still have those desires, but what? So maybe the question is, is What's the line? <coughs> There's a very thin line between sanity and insanity. <laughs> and sometimes, you know, maybe I'm able to pull back, but somebody who's had the life of I incredible depravity, it, it is a survival thing. So we're all, we all, we all have aggression, but do we have the tools to express it? Is, is there something innate in the psyche that you think that makes some people succumb to that more easily than more quickly than others? Well, we all have different temperaments, you know. It's very complex. I don't think it's black or white, obviously, but um, some of us have an issue with it, you know. Some of us are more volatile, you know, you know whether it's a physiological or a, a psychological, whatever the impetus is. Uh, I mean, I could easily, by the grace of God, there go I, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know. I mean, we think in our own lives where we've been aggressive or violent. Because there are people, <coughs> you know, that where the father's gone, you know, I mean, if you look at, I mean, I, I guess there's not many that rise above it, but I mean, I know Ben Carson, Dr. Ben Carson, mm -hmm. who's, I guess he's thrown his hat into the ring for uh, uh, right. president, president uh, pre to, be, to run for president on the Republican side. I mean, I guess he had, a, there was the father was gone, and there was, mm -hmm. I don't know exactly how poor they were, but he, he refers to himself as being very poor. Mm -hmm. um, but he did have his mother that that mm -hmm. was, you know, pushing him to do things and go here mm -hmm. and go there, stay away from this and that. And um, so, I mean, it, 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 it can be, you can overcome that. I mean, it's... Well, yeah, I mean, there's lots of examples, but again, you I mean, know. he could have just sloughed his mother off and said, you know, mm -hmm. I don't want to hear that, I want to be with... So, I mean, there's some, I mean, I, I guess I'm trying to get, is there some, is there something innate in people that it makes them more good than bad or more bad than good or some innate something. I mean, I've also heard people talk about, say, raising a child and that from day one the child was difficult or from mm -hmm. day one the child was just sort of angelic and, and what, what would you say about that? What do you think about that? Have you, well, is that innate yeah, quality? I mean, I, I, can, I, I relate to... Don't you mean by temperament? Well, I mean, you know, I mean, again, it, we all have it within us. I, I, but we, you and I are not the same kind of people as maybe somebody who grew up in a place where they were physically, emotionally, and sexually abused. I mean, or traumatized. And, and trauma is probably a good example. If you're traumatized as a child, I mean, how do you recover from something like that? But some people do. A lot of people do. Overcome that. So, like, again, I can relate person. I came from a poor family. My dad struggled with substance abuse. I was very blessed because I had young, my father was 19 when he had me, but I was blessed with incredible grandparents, grandfather, grandmother. They did, I did everything with them. You know, I huh. went to a parochial school. I went to a small town. There, you know, all, I had all those other uh, resources to support me 
and, and but only only by having those blessings was I able to get out of a small town <laughs> say well maybe I want to go to school or study you know again we go back to opportunity give everybody give me the opportunity so that and I'll do it I'll work hard and people like uh, the good doctor you know they we can transcend there are redemptive but aspects of life but again if I start off with those elements of support versus somebody who doesn't, mm -hmm. the life's going to be totally different. Right, right. So there are haves and have-nots. So, you know, we all, we all have an obligation to help people, and, we, and, and in many we haven't done a very good job. But you know what? I just want to mention one thing: the church has done a lousy job. <laughs> I mean, we're the voices of the other than the political, who, the people who have an ulterior motive like Sharpton. Mm -hmm. Where's the rest of the church that's shouting against injustice, about against ISIS, against, well, where are they? You know, well, there's you know, few uh, voices, but I think this is a time, especially for people of faith, it's time to stand up and, and, be, and, and, to be, and, and to be, and to be, and to be vocal. So like in the country right now, the more conservative you are, or the more traditional you are, the more you're hated. Yes, you know, I've, that's I've right. Seen, it, it seems to me like it's very, I'm, I'm becoming less and less <laughs> popular to have any kind of uh, traditional values, and uh, that's scary. Wow. So Christianity is becoming, in and of itself, politically incorrect. So well, you know, I always at a service. It's kind of one of these hybrids. It's sort of part Baptist and part I don't know what. <coughs> Unlike, of course, the Anglican Church. And um, there had just been the beheadings out on the beach. Those 23 men that they get. And there wasn't a peep. Yeah, I know. There wasn't a word. You know, there was, I mean, it was kind of vaguely alluded to during the sermon, but I, I, I think, like, what, you must be kidding. Because they were, it was a Christian church yeah. I was in. Well, I think American religion particularly is, it's too cozy, you know. I've got my church, I've got my salvation, and, you know, if you want to come along, life's too good, you know. We haven't been, but we are being challenged now. I mean, standing up for what you believe, standing up for Christ, if you come from a traditional church, it could cost you your life now, especially, well, it does, and as we see on TV. Right. And, and, and what, that's coming. It's going to be on our shores if we don't do anything. Oh, yes. But we need to stand up. The Sharia law. But I think that those of us who are committed Christians, you know, we, we don't have to accept the fact that we're all homophobic or Islamophobes or... <laughs> racist and I mean uh, that's what's getting very uh, weary oh, and we that, need to th be those vocal. Those insults just tossed around constantly. But we need to start being vocal not only politically vocal but we need to be very vocal in a radical way you know. So in other words I mean Christ himself in scripture said you know the, you know, the world hated me it's going to hate you worse. So we can't you know we're, we're, I hmm. think we're too cozy and, and we're too cozy and we need to become more of going back to the roots of not being afraid of speaking up for what's well, holy and good. <laughs> but well, we, nobody, I don't hear a lot of voices doing that. Well, right it's because now. these epithets are thrown around and everybody's afraid, you know, to be called, uh, you know, because somebody f calls them racist. I mean, you know, that shuts a lot of people up. Now, yeah, but it should not silence us. Anymore. No, it shouldn't. Just because I disagree with a current or whatever is the latest or the greatest, or if I disagree with a, with a President Obama, you know, that doesn't make me a racist. But, but that's been a very effective tool. It has. To but, <laughs> but what is, for example, democracy or is, is, is an opportunity for diversity, that I should be able to express what I believe vigilantly just as much as somebody, whether I'm on the right or the left. That's what scares me. <laughs> but there's no um, tolerance for that anymore. That's really scary. And the other thing is, you know, it's, it's, it just seems to feed on itself because um, I know when I was teaching, I, I taught from the city of Boston, and I would notice that very few colleagues would ever tell these kids that's not, that's not the right thing to do. That's a mistake. They, and, of course, because nobody says that to them anymore because that's not popular or that's not mm -hmm. considered nice, then when they hear somebody criticize them, they, you know, they kind of get up on their high, you know, they kind mm -hmm. of, outraged and um, and I mean you know that's um, 
And that, that's, a, that's another, to me, that's like a, another one of these so-called politically correct ways to, but, but they need, and I think a lot of them want some kind of parameters, they want some kind of limits, but they're so unused to hearing that. Now, when, you, when you're counseling this, this um, do, you, do you ever feel like, see, I, I mean, when I was going to school, I'm sure the same thing was with you. I mean, they, they really incorporate this idea of what was right and wrong. Without it being religious, they would, you know, wouldn't be, <clears throat> we did have prayer in the schools in those days, but the uh, Ten Commandments weren't referenced. Mm -hmm. but it was just that that was sort of an undercurrent whether you were talking about literature, you were talking about history, you know, and and you got it at home, and then you did get it at school. But I don't think that's coming across at all now. I, I don't. I think the teacher. In fact, I know the teacher discouraged from, you know, from going down that road. Mm. Well, I mean, that's another complex situation. <laughs> um, there's a lot of narcissism now. Oh, yes, yep, yep. And um, <laughs> I think we've forgotten, you know, what is it to get out of oneself and to give life or, or to sacrifice or to give life to somebody else. And I mean, how's that interpreted? A lot of us are entitled. <laughs> you know, I deserve whatever, but I, I, again, what, what gives life and what takes it away? I mean, there's nothing more wonderful than to help somebody in a, like a counseling situation. Somebody who's desperate, they're in a lot of pain or they're traumatized. It takes a lot of uh, courage to even go to ask for somebody. I need counseling, so. Especially, you know, I mean, I, I don't do secular counseling. I do what's really more Christ-centered counseling, you know? In other words, as a secular therapist, I'm, this is nothing against secular therapy, uh -huh. but I've been through a lot of it. <laughs> I can make you feel good. Is that good. part of your training that's required when you when you get the PhD in clinical psychology? Well, I went Pacifica Graduate Institute, so it's I went to a program that it was more focused on depth psychology, D E P T H. So really, uh, hmm. the psychology uh, of the unconscious, so more Freudian hmm. and Jungian, but I particularly um, a lot of focused on on spirituality and a Jungian psychology so that's a long story mm -hmm. but um, um, again I can, as a secular counselor I can make you feel good but as a, as a faith-based counselor I'm the conduit and God's the healer and it actually makes my counseling easier because to invite the third person into the room <laughs> and to help people experience the divine and the holy I, nothing is more, it gives me more joy as a priest than as a counselor than to see those moments when there are tremendous breakthroughs. And we all, we're all carrying around. It's like, you know, it's like the healing, well, they, uh, in the healing ministries or uh, deliverance. There's a lot of people who are very attracted to deliverance prayer. Well, we all need deliverance well, in some area. That? Well, I mean, you know, we all need deliverance. <laughs> we all have a shadow side. We all need deliverance from whatever. We have, we have, we didn't have uh, Jesus and Joseph as parents, you know. So uh, epitaphs like dysfunctional families and stuff like that. Well, we all have dysfunctional families. We all have substance abuse somewhere in our family tree. We all have things, and you know. So just again, where do I want to be healed in my life? Is it interfering? How do I be a whole person, physically, spiritually? So, anyways, people will come to me because they know I'll respect their faith. And I won't poo-poo it because, as I was telling you earlier in the program, ever since uh, Freud's book, uh, The F uh, Future of Illusion, it's pretty much slammed the door on uh, dovetailing spirituality and psychiatry. So we need to have approaches to counseling and healing that include one's faith and familiar religious practices. You know, I've often wondered at the fact that uh, it seems like the majority of, 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 of psychiatrists and psychotherapists are, are Jewish, and I wondered if it was part of their tradition to discuss and analyze things, like the way in, in those when they talk about the Torah and the different angles of, I, I often wondered if that's what would lead them into, into talking therapy. I, I have no idea, I guess so. I, I don't know, really. I mean, there are, 
I don't think the ethnicity has a lot to do with it. But I mean, there are a lot more people now who are insisting on a holistic approach, which includes a person's formation, their faith formation, uh, what they believe, and what gives them hope. So, I mean, I can't imagine not including that in, in helping somebody to become whole. So I'm, I'm, not, I'm not a secular therapist. I don't have any interest. I'm trained in it. But again, um, you have to have, it's, it's who we are as human beings. We're wired for spirituality. Hmm. I mean, we're, collectively we are. How could we not use that, utilize the, the, one of the most important dimensions of our life in the, in the process of healing? And when you say spirituality, you mean, uh, I mean, excuse me. I'm sorry, you, go ahead. Do you mean belief in a higher order, a higher well, being? Well, spirituality is like one sense of the other, one sense of what's greater than you. Okay. One sense of the holy, one sense of the divine. And that's, you know, that's very different, but it's the experience. So if you and I are on top of a mountain, that might be your peak experience. For me, I've had several I could talk about, but everybody has something that's sacred in their life. So I don't have, it doesn't have to go into, you know, I don't have to convince you to believe the same way I do, because that would, that's not how it works. It's, again, it's to, in, to open doors to put you in touch with a higher power. For me, it's God, and of course, I'm, you know, I believe in, in Jesus Christ with my whole heart, soul, and mind, and my neighbor as myself. But to bring, help people to experience that. That's what's missing, not only in psychology or, or clinical research. I think it's missing in society. As a matter of fact, Massachusetts has the lowest number of people in the whole country that attend church on Sunday. Is that so? With all yeah. the Catholics? Wow. Of the age. This is the age, though. Huh. Mm -hmm. Gee, that's astonishing. Mm -hmm. you, know, you know, just we just have about five minutes. I, uh, you you re referenced them, you know, the, the organized church. Um, do you think, because I, I know there are coalitions of pastors, and there's somebody named mm -hmm. Rivers, I think, in Boston, and he comes on and he talks, and everything, something happens. Mm -hmm. uh, why do you think they don't get through to people? Do you, do you think it's this, do you think it's this sense of entitlement, uh, well, of, uh, again, coming down mm -hmm. from, from all these government programs that in this fixation on materialism that that they just don't hear what because they don't hear what but in other words I know there are a lot of black um, there are a lot of black ministers that have different coalitions trying to work with these kids or trying mm -hmm. to turn things around and they they, you know, they condemn the behavior but they I don't mean, seem to be making much well I worked in Wa Southeast Washington DC for a year oh my goodness and which was a wonderful experience but the most respected person in those communities are the clergy. And they're doing a tremendous job. And we don't hear a lot about them, but and they're doing a tremendous job in Boston, too. Thank God. So maybe <laughs> things would be even worse. I beg your pardon? You think maybe things would be even worse? Yeah. I mean, there'd <laughs> be anarchy. <laughs> I mean, but, but again, the point is, is, you know, I mean, in my life, I remember there was a, a priest who, when I was growing up, and he, he was a very healthy priest and really helped me during the developmental years, the eighth, uh, seventh, eighth, ninth grade, and really mentored me, you know? And, and it was a, he was one of the most important people in my life. And I think of him a lot, and, uh, but he genuinely and authentically cared about me. And that's what breaks through all of this. Because the, my favor, one of my favorite scriptures is perfect love, it's 1 John 4:18. Perfect love casts out all fear. It, it, it's the one thing, and it's, it's an agape, unconditional divine love. It's the one thing that can heal us and can heal any situation. You know, Father Terrence, we have to stop because okay. the time is up. I went pretty, pretty quickly. Um, so thank you so much for, thank you for coming on. You're welcome. On. Thank you for thank you. allowing me the time to come here. Oh, Good. And uh, thank you for watching State and Local. We'll be back with another show pretty soon. Uh, my guest was Father Terrence McGillicuddy, who is the priest at St. Kild Bridget of Kildare's Anglican Church in Medway. Uh, and so thank you for watching. And you, this is Norfolk Public Access. I'm Anne-Marie Battistone. Thank you.